Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, another episode of Aging in Action. And I'd like to introduce our host today. We have with us today Michael Nyson, and he is with uh, the National Institution on Aging. Welcome, Michael. Thanks for having me. It's uh, really great to be here with you. Well, not here, but you know. <laughs> Virtually here. <laughs> Virtually, yeah. It's the new norm, I believe. So, Michael, um, from what I understand, you work at uh, Ryerson University, is that? Yeah, the National Institute on Aging. It's uh, relatively new, what we call a think tank or a research center located at Ryerson University in Toronto. In Toronto. And uh, we have a relatively unique mandate in Canada. There's all kinds of great centers, university and others, that focus on some aspects of aging, whether it's clinical health, social well-being, that sort of thing. Uh, the NIA is the first organization in Canada to pull all the aspects of aging uh, together under one roof. So we look at uh, finances, retirement readiness, uh, health care, personal health, as well as social well-being. And then with the added uh, unique flair that we focus on public policy. So what can governments do to help Canadians as they age? Uh, how do we collectively confront an aging population? And what do we have to do to adapt and evolve our systems of support to meet that need? Uh, and then we also work with industry and other academic partners who also you know, need help or insights, uh, figuring out how to navigate new markets, new issues dealing with older people. Uh, uh, so in that sense, uh, we comprehensively tackle the issues of aging in Canada. Well, that's wonderful. I mean, that looks, it's something that's so important nowadays uh, because our, our aging demographic, I, I think Canada is, is, is changing. We're now, you know, everybody's kind of older versus the younger generation is a, is a smaller group. Um, so from what I understand as well, like, uh, you've done research on long-term care facilities. Um, can you tell us maybe a little bit about that? Like, uh, what's the future in long-term care look like here for, for our aging demographic here in Canada? Yeah, that's a, it's, it's a big story. So we actually started looking at long-term care last year uh, in partnership with a number of organizations, including Advantage Ontario, uh, the Canadian Medical Association, Home Instead, ESSID, and the Canadian Institute of Actuaries. And we pulled together that team specifically because uh, all the organizations have a core competency in one of the areas of long-term care or work. But our, our job even then before COVID, and the reason I'm giving you the backstory is but because this has been an issue that's been boiling under the surface probably for 20 years, right? Where do we age? How do we age? Uh, does some, you know, do people need to go into institutions? Some people do. How do we get more people aging at home and supporting in place? And so last year we started looking at, at that, uh, both in terms of the health and sort of setting of where we age, as well as the financing. And one of the big findings we found, for example, this is again before COVID, is that with population aging, Canadians are having fewer children, uh, there's more of us in general, we're looking at long-term care costs that would grow uh, by 30 million in just the next 30 years, right? So we're growing from, uh, we're growing from about 22 billion to 71 billion, uh, sorry, I should say 50, 50 billion dollars. And this was again before COVID. And then COVID hit, and uh, as a poll that we just released yesterday shows, about 90% 90, 90 of Canadians are now fully aware of what's happening in long-term care. Uh, and COVID has spared uh, no expense in really tearing a gash through the long-term care sector. Uh, so, you know, Canada roughly has now approximately 10 to 12,000 10 to 12,000 deaths in Canada. 80% of those have happened in long-term care settings. So the vast majority of what we've been experienced with COVID has happened in these congregate living settings. So retirement homes, nursing homes, uh, and it's, it's been absolutely catastrophic. The system is still trying to catch up to the first wave and now the second wave is hitting. And what we're finding is that there's a number of sort of systemic vulnerabilities that have been exposed by COVID. Things that we were talking about last year that, you know, people in this space who have family members in long-term care, they might have known about COVID is really brought to the surface, right? So when you put a lot of older people in a room together and a virus comes, well, it's going to spread. Uh, they already have natural, you know, challenges with immunity and robustness. And then, you know, other issues like, are there enough care, healthcare workers to, to really serve this population? Well, it turns out they're wasn't so they work across multiple homes and they you know helped contribute uh, to infection rates and so it's it's been a, a real complex uh, mess of issues that has led to 80 percent of deaths in long-term care wow that's a huge number mm -hmm. and it's really really sad um 
so part of what you do um, is that, you know, is that consist of trying to create a plan or best practices moving forward? Yeah, it's going to have to be a combination of both. And uh, I'm sure we could talk all afternoon if we if we started tearing away the layers. So in the big picture, what we're uh, suggesting and other organizations have been saying this for decades, I think COVID has given us a reason to bring it up to the surface and to the attention of the public more broadly. Uh, but what we're saying and others are also saying is we need to move away from a model that puts older people in institutions. Uh, so there's always going to be a, a space and a need for nursing homes. Uh, absolutely. I mean, 70% of people who are in nursing homes have dementia, right? And so then when you add other vulnerabilities that come with old age and poor health, there will be some segment there. But we really need to shift our focus into helping Canadians age at home for as long as possible, right? And oftentimes, the thing that might tip someone into going into a nursing home, surely it could be a, you know, a catastrophic health event, but oftentimes if you start losing the ability to take care of things at home on your own, little things even, clearing snow, shopping groceries, if you know going up your stairs isn't as easy as it used to be, if your spouse has passed away, sometimes these things, which you know we call little, they're not little in an individual uh, sense, but compared to big system challenges, these things will you know, tip someone into going to a nursing home. Uh, what we and others have been saying for decades is there's got to be a way that we could support them to age at home. So whether it's bringing in a little bit of home care, uh, whether that's, you know, the, the bits that the provinces could pay for, whether people are purchasing home care services on their own, we really need to shift our mindsets and our systems to get people aging at home for longer. One of the other things that happened with COVID, uh, not surprisingly, obviously, with the uh, social distancing is that you're 70 times safer in your own home than you are in a nursing home, right? So when wow. something like COVID comes or even the regular flu in, in, in a year, uh, we, you know, we, until COVID, we hadn't thought about, well, you know, society didn't really think much about the flu, but it's a top 10 killer in Canada. Uh, so if we can keep people aging at home for longer, uh, that's a major fix. Uh, but we also know we have healthcare worker shortages, right? So as the population ages and uh, there are more of us who are getting older, we're going to need more help taking care of each other and ourselves. Well, the rest of the world's in the same situation, right? And so we're yeah. trying to immigrate people to come here and help, but other countries are doing the same. So those are some of the big challenges uh, and sm small challenges. It's not going to be a silver bullet that gets us there. But, you know, if there's a silver lining to COVID, I think it's that it's really brought this issue to the surface and it's getting governments, uh, public, private sectors thinking about it. <laughs> wow. I just wanted to that's ask. Really, that's really interesting stuff. Yeah. Uh, Nikki, um, I believe that you had a question that you wanted to bring up. Um, thanks, Lizette. Uh, and then Gwen, I guess you can go after me. I saw you put your hand up there. <laughs> we were all like, what? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, like you mentioned, COVID has definitely brought forth a lot of concerns and things that are happening in the long-term care sector and making people talk about it even more. Um, how does the pandemic experience in long-term care sector compare to other countries? I mean, we've talked about what we're going through in Canada. So are other countries experiencing the same challenges that we are experiencing with long-term care? Yeah, I mean, to a degree, every country, right? we know certain things about COVID and I'm not a medical expert, so there's a limit to my ability to talk about some of the specifics about the epidemiology, but it obviously uh, disproportionately affects older people, people with immune uh, compromised immune systems, comorbidities, and obviously a lot of those things uh, are more likely to happen as you get older. Uh, we actually, you know, the 80% of deaths in Canada that came from the National Institute on Aging, we created a, a tracker uh, and a map on our website. You could visit it uh, on the bottom of our front page. Uh, we've mapped every single long-term care home and uh, retirement home. And so it'll show families who are living in that area, whether there's an outbreak. Uh, but what we did with that data is it actually helped us connect with international organizations in the UK, uh, here in Canada, the US, where we did a comparative study. And across countries similar to Canada, uh, so like France, Germany, 14 countries, their average death rate uh, for all COVID cases amongst uh, long-term care is 42%. So ours is 80%. So when it comes to a comparison between Canada in this sector uh, compared to other countries, we're doing significantly worse. Uh, and some of the factors are obvious. So, you know, some of the best case countries are countries like Denmark. And again, we knew that Denmark was ahead of the curve last year when we were doing our reports. They have a much more home-based model of, of, of long-term care, much more community-based. Uh, so people tend to age with support at home for longer uh, and they they invest uh, disproportionately more money into home care than they do into nursing
nursing home care. So you can see by, when you look at the comparisons across countries that the systems, the way we treat and, and provide housing and care for older people really does come to a fore with something like COVID. You can't escape it. Uh, if you have weak points, uh, the pandemic will expose it. Thank you. Gwen, I think you had a, a question, right? Yeah, and actually, you actually answered it to some degree, Michael, because I wondered if there was other models of, uh, uh, in the world of what, who is working better with an aging population. And, and um, you know, I totally believe as a, as a senior myself and as a, you know, as a taxpayer that it's much more advantageous to have somebody uh, staying in their home but I know when, when my dad, when we had him at home for the last six months of his life, because we promised he, he wanted to avoid hospital as much as pro possible. But just the eight of us, plus all of the uh, healthcare workers, it was exhausting. It, I couldn't believe um, how intense it was to look after a person when you've got eight people plus healthcare workers. And because he was a veteran, he even had even more. So, you know, I wondered, like, how can we address that and, and what country is doing a better job? But I guess Denmark is one of them. Well, yeah, and, and, but you actually indicate a, an interesting case where there are going to be differences across countries that we can't always replicate, right? So where we're talking about uh, reducing the size of rooms and the occupants, that's something that we could do. So, for example, uh, in Ontario, until recently, until uh, you know, a decade ago, or you could have up to four people in a room. Uh, those are disappearing. It's getting closer to three and then two. Uh, the recommended number is no more than two because of course then you spread the virus uh, more. So these are some things that we could do with our existing system to improve it. You know, it, it doesn't have to be leveled to the ground completely. There are things we could do, but you know, to your point, uh, and, and our study looked at this last year too, you say they were eight of you. Uh, that's increasingly rare in Canada. Right. And so you had a large support network. Uh, what Bonnie Jean McDonald, one of our researchers, did when she was looking at it is she was able to map fertility rates. So the younger baby boomers actually have fewer children than even the babe, older baby boomers. Right. So there's going to be fewer family members when you compare that to Italy, you know, or, you know, France and Spain, where they still have cultures where families are larger. They live together. Those are bigger support systems. Uh, but at the same time, just to make it even more complicated, what we all saw happen in Italy in the first wave of COVID last year was kind of related to those family dynamics. People lived together, the young were bringing virus into the home. So each country will have its own set of challenges, but I think we could learn from each other and take the best from various uh, areas and really pump it up. And, and I think the encouraging thing is that uh, leading experts around the world do talk to each other. You know, so Dr. Samir Sen on our team, he's well connected across the world. We do learn from best practices, both in terms of how to treat something like COVID, but then also bigger system things, right? And so, you know, he's taken trips to Denmark. How do we replicate aspects of that model here that can be replicated here? Uh, and I think we're gonna have to chip away from it a, a number of directions to really get to something that works better for all of us. Wow, that that's really uh, that's great, and it's great that Dr. Samir is uh, is part of of your team because uh, he's very knowledgeable person. Um, Joy, before uh, you yeah. you had questions, right? Yeah, you wanted to touch on. Yeah, so Michael, you you touched on it a little bit. Um, one of the things that I'm really I'm a, a huge advocate for and, and I have passion for is that greenhouse model that I know part of your team has discussed and you did discuss a little bit of on that you know one in 65 uh, age what one in out of 65 one out of six sorry one out of six are 65 or older right mm -hmm. right now currently we have 38,000 on a wait list for long-term care why can we not see that shift or what can our listeners viewers do to say hey we need to see the shift Something should have told us in June when COVID was really impacting a lot of our long-term care. What can we do today to help make that shift happen? And especially when you have a wonderful model that would be and could be, you know, for like you say, 10 years, 20 years, another pandemic, we could be better prepared. So what can we do today to help? Well, I think what we need to do today, and, and there is a little bit of an issue where, um, where we're still trying to keep this issue in the public attention. So during the summer when the infection rates were going down a little bit, people were starting to go out. 
uh, the, the catastrophe that we saw in long-term care in the spring was already washing out of people's memories, right? And so the second wave is kind of bringing that back. But the reason I mention that is that, you know, as a society, as a culture, we really haven't focused on this. There are great minds, smart people, dedicated people working on things like the greenhouse model. Uh, but for some reason, governments uh, across the country really haven't uh, attach themselves to that level of innovation. So what we still see from governments, you know, in Ontario and others, is they're promising new beds within the existing model, right? And so, and this this is a nonpartisan statement. Every single party uh, does this thing where they'll offer thirty five thousand beds over the ten years within the existing model. So what we really need to do, and what we're hoping COVID will do, is you know, you, you, it's, it's unlikely that we could shift a system fundamentally while we're dealing with the day-to-day -day of COVID, uh, but we want to keep attention on this issue so that when COVID hopefully goes away sooner than later, uh, we still have that impetus to act. And we have to build and invest, not just financially, but culturally in how we think of long-term care into better models, models of integrated care that bring in uh, social care as well as physical care, uh, that respect the importance of essential caregivers, family caregivers, and the role of it. And uh, some of these things, I think, are cultural as much as they are political. We have to shift our mindsets. Uh -huh. uh, we tend to see older people as not our problem unless it's implicating our family. I think that's one big obstacle we have to overcome. Uh, but to your point about 38,000 on the wait list, uh, there's 400,000 people living at home with unmet care needs currently. And so wow. the situation we're trying wow. to avoid is this bulge where you know, again, to my earlier point, maybe they don't need intensive eight hour a day care, but if we can get them more care, can we keep them longer? And I think really the goal is if you do home care and long term care properly, over time you could maybe reduce the amount of cost it takes to do something because you're not building as many nursing homes. You could invest more money in, long, in, in home care. Uh, and then really, I mean, we have to focus on these two issues. How do you keep people out of institutions for as long as possible? And then how do you make those institutions as good as possible for the people who absolutely need them. So this is a tall order. I, I worked in government for the Minister of Seniors. I'm not going to pretend that this is an easy issue. It can't be solved overnight, but we also can't let uh, the experience with COVID recede as it gets better. I just had another question. Um, and because I am a senior and this is on my horizon, <laughs> um, what I really find um, insulting a lot of times is people deciding things for seniors without even their input, as if a senior no longer has uh, feelings or uh, any, you know, personal uh, thought about things, and, and maybe they don't want to be put in that long-term care, whatever. I just find uh, the treatment of seniors and how they're regarded as no longer they have any input. So does your uh, think tank do you pull in from society, from different demographic uh, of, of seniors, you know, young seniors, elderly? Like, do you take input from seniors? Yeah, we absolutely do. Uh, you know, we're a small institute, so it's, there's only so many seniors you could meet in person, but we do hold engagement sessions. We work with associations that represent seniors. I personally, uh, before I was here and in government, uh, I worked for CARP. Uh, an advocacy organization with 300,000 seniors, uh, chapters across the country, uh, would meet with them routinely, survey them. And actually just yesterday, uh, our institute released a survey that we did with TELUS Health, looking at how uh, the pandemic has affected older people's mindsets about where they want to live, where they want to age. And not surprisingly, almost 100% of Canadians over 65 want to age at home, uh, but they're not sure that they know how to do it. And I think, you know, to your point, you're absolutely right. Ageism is something, I mean, it's the kind of thing we're saying now. It's the only acceptable ism still left in society, right? And I think that the, the tragedy of that, not to say that any form of bigotry or hatred is acceptable, but the tragedy is that we're all going to get older. And that's the thing that always confounds me when I talk to my colleagues. I started off in the aging industry when I was still in my 20s. And so I'd get jobs, you know, why are you working with the old people? What's going on here? Yeah. Well, if nothing else, I'll make the future better for myself. And my, exactly. And my family, right? but, you know, you can't escape older age unless you have bad luck. 
So, you know, you should care more about your elders. Uh, and, you know, we tackled that on head on. Uh, Dr. Sinha in particular went slightly viral this spring when, I don't know if you recall, the governor of Texas was basically saying, look, let the older people take a bullet for everyone else, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Burn through them oh. and deal with it. And, you know, when we can, where we can, we have to call that out because that lends, uh, that's not only a sort of moment of, of hatefulness, it also impacts the way the rest of society thinks of older people. And we can't let that go unchecked. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Th thank you, Michael. And I, uh, we're going to have to wrap up very, very shortly. So is there any final thoughts, anything you want to touch on, Michael, um, before we wrap up our episode today for our audience? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's a message I've been telling people is we do have system level challenges, things that governments will tackle, uh, but we can't on a personal basis wait for someone else to sort of fix everything for us. And so to your point to whether you have large families, small, small families, start talking about this to them. Let your plans be known to the people who might have a decision to make on your behalf. If you need powers of attorneys, wills, get that lined up. Your wishes have to be firm in everyone's mind. And I know it's, it's one of those uncomfortable things that people don't like to talk about, right? What's gonna happen when I get sick? But if you don't, uh, your family might not know what to do even if they wanna do the best for you. So have those conversations, plan ahead, and really think about you know, where do I want to be 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now? Perfect. Thank you, Michael. I mean, why much. we do our show, we help people age in action. And I think that's a perfect point to end the episode on um, for today. Michael, we'll definitely put your information um, and a link to your website with all the great resources at www.aginginaction.ca. Um, and we want to thank you for coming on with us today and talking with us and having that conversation. And let's share the resources. Let's keep talking and let's help our community um, age in action. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Michael. Mm -hmm.